Good morning, everybody. I hope you slept well and are ready to go with a challenging and interesting talk. <laughs> well, I hope so, anyway. So, the outline of the talk is here. Um, I'm going to talk about where I'm coming from and things like that. Um, then what is elicitation and how we do it and so on. So it's all about elicitation. But I begin with some other things like the context that I'm coming from. So, I'm a statistician, okay? So that means uncertainty is my raison d'etre. I am an uncertainty person, it's all I do. Everything I do as a statistician is about quantifying, managing, understanding uncertainty. And I'm a committed Bayesian, which is nice because if you like uncertainty and probability, then you should be a, a Bayesian because everything is probability then. You don't have to dream up other ad hoc ideas. But I do find myself something of an outlier in this meeting. So I should say, uh, yesterday I saw some very interesting talks. Some had some really nice challenging problems that would be quite hard to do from a proper Bayesian perspective. In particular, anything which involves group decision making, of course, is outside the framework for Bayes. It's something nobody knows how to do. But, well, I'm known for being a little bit confrontational sometimes. So, I've been hearing, and no doubt will continue to hear, the old specious arguments used to justify old and new solutions to familiar non-problems like imprecise probabilities, confidence in beliefs, ambiguity, deep uncertainty, Ellsberg, and fuzzy. I only heard fuzzy once in passing yesterday. I hope I'm not going to hear it again. So, I'm not going to talk about that anymore um, for three reasons. Firstly, it would take a long time. Secondly, really, it's not the right way to go about it. We should have discussion, not polemic. And also because my talk was never supposed to be about that. It's supposed to be about elicitation. So that's what I'm going to tell you about. One of my principal research areas is elicitation, both in theory and in practice. As a practitioner, I have elicited expert judgments and probability distributions from people in various areas, but I also am heavily involved in teaching and uh, didactic work of that kind. I, I give short courses of various kinds in elicitation to various different clients. I'm in the process of developing, should be ready in the next few months, an e-learning course to teach experts how to make the necessary judgments. And a major part of my effort, uh, particularly last year when we did a, a big revision of it, is the shelf package. Shelf is all about guidance and tools for people to actually do elicitation. I've been working particularly with two big organizations, GlaxoSmithKline, pharmaceutical company. Um, they are, certainly the statisticians within the company, are wanting to roll out the use of elicitation right across the company in all therapeutic areas for the purpose of understanding the risks associated with different ways of progressing a drug. There are many new drugs at an early stage of development. They have very little information about how it's going to work in terms of hard data. So they use a lot of expert judgment to decide whether uh, this drug is going to produce the required effects and whether it will have serious side effects and so on. So it's all about making investment decisions, basically. And what they want to know is what is the probability that this trial will be successful? And that has nothing to do with or very passing in, uh, connection with the so-called power of a test, of a trial. So they, what we calculate is what's called assurance, which is a Bayesian analog of, of the power function. And there's a very powerful way of deciding what you're going to do with the next trial. European Food Safety Authority, EFSA, is a, an agency of the European Commission. It conducts risk assessments on behalf of the European Commission into various risks associated with food and feedstuffs, plants, bacteria, etc particularly emerging risks affecting the EU. 
So I've been involved in a couple of things which were concerned with diseases that are not yet in the European Union but are on their way. How long will it take? What can we do about it? They again are wanting to roll out right across the organization the use of elicitation. This time they're going to use it for uh, the parameters of risk models. These problems they're dealing with are complex, involve bringing together evidence from a variety of sources and they use modeling to do that. But inevitably within those models, particularly when we're talking about emerging risks, there can be very little actual hard data and evidence available to use. So they want to use elicitation, they want to do it properly. In the past they've done it very badly. To populate their risk models with parameter values and uncertainty around those parameter values so that they can do what is currently called in the engineering and applied maths world uncertainty quantification. I haven't heard that phrase here today, this meeting yet but it's, it's a big buzz phrase in that area. It's about propagating uncertainty in inputs through to understanding the uncertainty and outputs of a model. I'm sure the climate people have heard about it. I've also been involved in a number of other areas, but I'll pass on and let's, let's just talk about uh, elicitation. What is it? I want to be absolutely clear. What I do is take knowledge that's coming from experts. And when I say experts, um, it doesn't have to be somebody you'd think of as an expert in the uh, everyday use of that word because it could just be the best person we have available, the one whose knowledge is what we want to use because it's better than what we've got ourselves. One or more persons experts concerning un an uncertainty quantity as a probability distribution, that's the crucial thing. We want to express uncertainty as a probability distribution. Anybody who wants to use anything else for expressing uncertainty is wrong, deluded. Okay, probability distributions are the only right way to quantify uncertainty. Typically it's conducted, have, have I annoyed enough people yet? Working I'm working on it, working on it, okay. <laughs> Typically conducted <laughs> as a dialogue. It's a dialogue between the experts. These are the people who have what we call substantive knowledge, knowledge about the parameters we're interested in, and somebody called the facilitator who has process knowledge, who knows about how to conduct effective elicitation. Ideally, we do it face to face. It may be done by video conferencing. I've done it that way. It's not as good. I've even tried to do it by teleconference. I don't like doing that at all, but it's possible if you have to. But you need to have a process whereby you can have, as I say, a dialogue. Why do we do it? Well, because expert knowledge is useful. It's useful in a number of ways, even where we've got data. Very often the data are not ideal. They're not strong, they're not high quality, they don't relate exactly to the thing we're interested in, but to something similar. We need expert knowledge, expert judgment to pull that together and say, what does this mean for the parameter I'm interested in? And of course, sometimes there's actually no data at all. It's purely expert judgment. If there were good enough data, of course, we wouldn't do this. If there's clear, well-defined data with a well-defined relationship to the parameter of interest, then we may also not need elicitation. But most of the time we do because it, the situation where that quality of evidence is around is, well, certainly rare when people are even thinking about doing elicitation. It doesn't come for free. Many people think, okay, we'll just ask an expert. It isn't that easy to do it right and to get reliable, reproducible quality results requires a significant effort. That's what I'm, this talk is going to be about, showing you what effort is involved in doing that. But even though it's not cheap, it's a lot cheaper than going and getting other new hard evidence, of course, most of the time. So we begin with something that may be an area that's well known to some of you, maybe to all of you, but it's usually not to the experts I'm working with. So I'm going to show you what the sort of thing we do to persuade experts that this is a realistic and sensible approach. Elicitation is a process of representing someone's knowledge about a, a certain parameter as a probability distribution. And we need to think about what probability means in this context. 
Suppose our parameter is the population size of some species. What does it mean to say there's a 60% probability that that population size is between here and here? It doesn't mean 60% of the time it's between there and there. Okay, and the population size is whatever it is today. It's a, it's a single number, it doesn't vary. We'll have defined it to be what is the population size today or at some appropriate point. So it isn't a variable. It doesn't have frequency type probabilities. So it has a unique value, it doesn't vary, and we need another kind of probability, and you probably know what I'm going to be saying, which is we need subjective probability to quantify this uncertainty. The probability distributions will be expert judgments. So the statement that S has a 60% probability of lying between two numbers is a judgment. It's a judgment of one or more experts, representing a degree of belief that they have that the treatment effect Treatment effect, that's hangover from a previous version of this talk, um, that that population size will be between A and B. And of course, these are called subjective probabilities, subjective because they are the judgments of individual experts based on their own knowledge. This is where we encounter difficulties often with experts. Experts are often scientists, and they've often been raised with the fiction that science is objective. So we have to dispel that. But they'd start off with this horror at the idea of subjectivity. So we need to educate them. So I give them this little dialogue between, on the left, this serious-minded, skeptical expert, and on the right, this friendly, helpful facilitator who's going to answer all the guy's questions. So he starts off by saying, you want to use subjective probability judgments? totally unscientific. Science is supposed to be objective, isn't it? Well, yes. It's the goal. We seek towards objectivity. Everything we do is to try and use evidence effectively, objectively, if you can. But science is not totally objective. Science progresses by people making judgments, debating those judgments. And after a time, the ones which are de deemed to be the ones that we can believe in rise to the surface. So we have this scientific objectivity, which is a temporary lack of disagreement. OK, that's the definition in science of what objectivity is in practice. Temporary because somebody will come and overthrow that theory at some point. But that's what we seek to do as far as we can. Subjective judgments, of course, are problematic. They're open to bias, prejudice, sloppy thinking, wishful thinking, all sorts of other things. Yes, they're judgments, but they need to be judgments that we make as honestly, carefully, and scientifically as objectively as we can. And we should use a process which encourages that. And that's the important point, is that scientists have to make judgments all the time. In fact, I sometimes say to a scientist who says, I'm not going to have anything to do with this because this is subjectivity and we don't do that in science. I say to this person, well, you need to resign your position. You're a senior scientist. You're well paid for what you do. You got there by making better judgments than all the other scientists in your field based on exactly the same evidence. That's how you got where you are. If you don't think you do this, then you should resign. Okay. It's very important. We have to hammer this home. OK, so good elicitation methods are formal, rigorous, probabilistic judgment techniques <coughs> following a recognized protocol, as we call it, designed to encourage thoughtful judgments and structured as far as possible to eliminate all those bad things, prejudice, bias, superstition, wishful or sloppy thinking, guessing, manipulation, blah, blah, blah. You could carry on. We try to get rid of all of that. The people that we get involved in seriously want to avoid all those things, and we present a process which attempts to do so and helps them to do so. So how do we do that? Well, uh, we have to be aware that there are some pitfalls to be avoided. Um, in particular, research in psychology, the so-called heuristics and biases movement, does reveal some interesting pitfalls and dangers that we have to be aware of. There's a lot of overreaction to these things, and they've been overinterpreted. But the research can be important and can be useful. Some of these heuristics are important for actual practical elicitation. 
The notion that these people say is that our brains evolved to make quick decisions in difficult situations. So if a saber-toothed tiger is running towards us, we don't have to think before we run, okay? We make good judgments in familiar situations which our forebears were familiar with. And they learnt to make these decisions very quickly. But probability is not something they had to do. And what's the probability this thing's going to attack me? What's the probability I will survive? No, you don't think about that. You run, OK? Now we need to do this. More complicated lives that we live, modern world, we do need to think about probabilities in order to do things carefully. And as a result of that, all those nice, clever, quick ways of thinking that we developed don't necessarily serve as well we need to find a slow way of thinking, as, as, uh, as they said, uh, Kahneman says, for instance, in this area. I'm going to mention two of these heuristics that are kind of important for us in, in elicitation. There are others, most of them less important than these. The, the message of all of them is how we ask the questions influences the answers. I have to be very careful about this. I was taught this as an undergraduate way, way, way back. You can't conceive of how far back it was when I was an undergraduate, OK? The teacher said, if you, if you need to be sampling anything, to getting information from anything, the last thing you want to get information from is people. People are really tricky. So if you want to go out there and do opinion polling and go and find out how they're going to vote in the next election, you have to be very careful. In particular, the way, the, the way you ask the questions and also who you are and how you present yourself affects the answers. If you're a nice, friendly chap, very personable, very likable, okay, which you want to be to get answers from them in the first place, that's the worst situation because they will give answers that they kind of think you want. This is, this is all this social interaction thing we have. Okay? It's, even, it's more, more marked with women than with men. But it is a case of, if they relate to you, they're almost trying to second guess the answer they think you want. And you can see a marked difference in the answers. So again, you have to be very careful about these things. I try to be very friendly and personable when I'm doing a dissertation, but I also try to be stern, you know, and, and in control. I don't want them to be too much wanting to do what I want to do. OK, so anchoring is one of these things. I often set this exercise. I ask students to answer two questions. Um, but the, half the class get these questions in one order and half them get them in the other order. How many Muslims are there in the UK? What is the probability that that's more than 8 million? What's the probability it's more than 2 million? They don't see the second question until they've answered the first one. The people who get the 8 million question first consistently, on average, give higher probabilities for both questions. Once you put that eight in their minds, they think eight is a reasonable number. It isn't. The number of Muslims in Britain is just over two million, OK? It's nowhere near eight million. But unless these people really know, you're asking them to make a judgment based on their best thinking about it, you put that number in their head, you've seriously disturbed their thinking. They not only give a higher probability for whether it's more than 8 million, they give a higher probability for whether it's more than 2 million. So they've already said there's a 30% chance of more than 8 million. They've got to give a bigger probability for more than 2 million, haven't they? So it strongly influences their answers. And yet, these are questions that people have traditionally asked when eliciting beliefs about things. What's the probability the variable's bigger than this or less than that? What's the probability bigger than this? And so on. As soon as you put those numbers out there, you will affect them. Any number that we introduce into the discourse, whether we do it or they do it, affects all subsequent judgments. So we, I don't ask what's the probability it's greater than 8 million. I ask for quantiles. I ask them for the median, quartiles, things like that, where they give me the numbers. But even then, as soon as they give them one number, it may affect what they do afterwards. So we have to think about the sequence in which we ask these things to minimize that anchoring effect. Another important heuristic is availability. The probability that we assign to an event is strongly influenced by whether we can call up to mind instances of that event. 
we, we look for positive values. We don't actually look for the negatives. We don't ask, how often have I not observed this? OK. If you ask the question the other way around, you get different answers. You don't get one minus the probability if you ask for what's the probability of something not happening. OK. In the UK, we, we notice this particularly in things like train accidents, things which get into the news. They're rare. They actually don't kill many people. There was a huge furore about one accident which I think killed four people. There probably was even many more killed on the roads in the same day and probably in a single accident there may have been more than four killed in the, on the roads. But, but that accident meant that the UK was suddenly scared about rail travel and rail travel was actually stopped while they checked all the track all across the country. Not all at the same time, but it made a massive effect on, on, the, on the country. And yet, it really is not a risky thing. But there was that accident. It looked nasty. I and mean, it was actually at a railway station, so it wasn't very nice. Anyway, another one. My risk of dying from a particular disease. If I can think of people who've got that disease, but in particular people who've died from it, then I'll rate that disease as more likely, even though there are all those hundreds of other people I know that haven't got it. You know, I'm, I'm arguing from a, observations of two or three instances. That's really bad statistics. But people do it. There's a lovely um, heuristic called the law of small numbers, which means that uh, if you give people data, they will treat those data as having the same inferential value, even when it's a small sample, as when it's a large sample. They just don't discriminate. They look at the point estimate, and, and then they put some fuzz around it, and that's it. Anyway, moving on. Response to this is to make sure that all the evidence is there, out there, available and reviewed before you go into it. So it's all in the mind, not just the, the selective things that stick in your mind. OK, uh, multiple experts. We very often need to use multiple experts. And the reason is we're asking serious questions. I said before, this is an effort that is a serious effort in itself. It's not cheap. It's not free, certainly. So people do it when it matters. When it matters, they want to get the best evidence. And so they typically want to gather knowledge from several experts. OK, but we still want a probability distribution at the end. OK, we want to know what is the, if you like, the view of the community out there, the combined knowledge of all these people about this parameter. So two big questions arise. How many experts and which experts? And how do we bung their views together to create a single distribution at the end. I'm going to address the first question after the second because they're kind of uh, related the other way around. How do we aggregate judgments? If we have multiple experts and we want a single distribution, there are two basic approaches. And I characterize them as aggregate the distributions, which means you, you get distributions for every expert, and then you use a formula to put them together called pooling. Or you aggregate the experts. You get the experts together, you get them to talk, and you elicit one distribution from them. And that's called behavioral aggregation. Psychologists have been involved. Neither of these is without problems, OK? Nothing's perfect. But on the whole, for various reasons, I prefer the behavioral approach. I don't like applying an ad hoc rule to combine things together. There isn't a single best way. No, there's no complete agreement amongst people who do this as to what's best. I use my methods. Other people use theirs. We don't usually bother to debate too much about it because we're not going to persuade each other, whatever happens. It's a bit like me not bothering to talk to you about all those other things I raised at the beginning of the talk. Well, how come you can't? Uh, you just said that you can't aggregate. Or you want me to? Make, make this formal. I, I, there's just a non sequitur. I mean, actually, I could have stopped you about 100 times, but <laughs> it finally got to me. Uh, a, a moment ago, you just said we want to uh, aggregate uh, expert, heterogeneous experts who have different uh, distributions. And then you were going to do behavioral aggregation. But then one sentence after that, you said there are all these other people who are experts like yourself in elicitation, and you don't agree on anything. And uh, well, why don't we sit around and do behavioral aggregation? Precisely. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, Precisely. I, I, you've got to be starring while doing 
OK. I will come back to that. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, had, I, was, I was made to accept there are other good ways of doing this by sitting in a, a panel with, convened by EFSA to prepare guidance for them. And there were people who were advocates of other methods there. So we came up with three that we, we felt um, we could all agree had, had merit, even if we didn't agree which was best. They're all considered acceptable with their own strengths and weaknesses, and, and they were called Sheffield, EFSA Delphi, and Cook. And they, this is a slide I give to those people to explain the differences between them. Um, Sheffield is a purely behavioral aggregation. Cook used his pooling. Um, the Delphi thing is kind of mixed because nobody ever reaches convergence with Delphi. So you do a couple of rounds, and then you pool. Um, Various ways of managing the experts, but in the Sheffield way, we actually do get them together because we're doing behavioral aggregation and so on. Point to, to, to raise at the bottom here, number of experts, um, four to eight. That's the sort of number that works best in, in the Sheffield method with behavioral aggregation. And you may think, well, we want to get lots of experts, we want lots of opinion. But actually, um, choosing the right experts, you get the right variety of opinion in there, and you get the possibility to debate them reasonably which you don't if you have 20 people in the room. It just doesn't work. OK, so I'm going to go through this Sheffield approach because it's the method that I use. Um, it's been refined over a number of years with colleagues helping me. And just to show you all the things that are involved in trying to do this well. Thorough preparation. The pre-elicitation stage is very important. You've got to identify, locate, recruit, train your experts. That's why I have this e-learning course in, in, in process of development. It will mean that we can give that to experts prior to them coming in so that they can be trained up, they can, be, uh, they can learn at least some of the basics and do a little experiment. And then we have to repeat it, of course, when they actually get in the room because you know, nobody remembers these things. But they're at least primed to, rem to remember it and to learn it better. Building an evidence dossier. Remember I said about having all that evidence there. You build this in, in advance. You make sure you've got everything there so that in the meeting you can refer to everything that's relevant. Then you bring the experts together into a workshop managed by a trained facilitator. And in the shelf system, uh, I'll give a little more detail of this shortly, we do firstly individual elicitations, but we don't pool them. We simply ask each individual expert to make their own judgments, and then we share that, and we debate it. And then we get them to discuss this with a view to reaching consensus judgments. And the whole process is documented by the use of standard forms. So, as I said just now, we elicit distributions first from experts separately. We share, obviously, the, the evidence dossier. We don't debate the dossier at this point. We're not interested in sharing opinions at this point. We want them to express what their starting position is based on that evidence. What, where do they come from? We know now the range of beliefs that we have before we try to aggregate them. Then they discuss it. The facilitator will lead this discussion, pointing out particular areas of difference that we'd like to debate and so on. And there's never a problem with people debating these things. The problem can be stopping them, which is why with 20 people it's just completely unmanageable. You need to actually be aware of when they're going over same on ground repeatedly, which they will very easily, and, and stop that, or when they're producing new thoughts. And of course, you don't want to stop that. They're going to be producing an aggregate distribution. And the key to this is what I call RIO, the rational impartial observer. They have to sit there and think, well, suppose somebody was watching what we were doing here and listening to what we've said. This is a sensible person, knows a bit about the field, because they can understand the arguments. What would they think? What would be reasonable for them to think? The idea is to try and get each expert to acknowledge the, the merit of what others have been saying. Now, they won't obviously shift a huge way. They won't all agree at the end of the day as to what is the right distribution. But what we're trying to get them to agree on, and generally they can agree on, 
is what it would be reasonable for somebody to think having seen and heard the discussion. And that's what we want to come away with because that's the consensus, that's the aggregation of their knowledge that we want. The facilitator, because we've got the initial starting point, can judge whether in reaching this consensus they have reasonably um, adapted in the light of the discussion. So um, there are various other heuristics involved here where people sometimes um, con converge too much and, and somehow have an illusion of more certainty than, than they would otherwise have. So you have to see, because you can see where they start from, you can see where, what, you know, if they've over-reduced over, over their uncertainty. You can also see whether one person's given up talking and, and has been sort of ignored and sidelined by the others. Whether that's reasonable depends on how the discussion's gone. So again, it's important for the facilitator to be watching out for all these things. The evidence dossier is an important thing. Experts' judgments should not differ because they start with different evidence. That's just making it more difficult to bring them together. They should start with all the same evidence, okay? And that means, actually, as soon as you know who they're going to be, you, you create your idea of what's the available evidence out there, but you ask them all to supply anything more that they're going to bring to the table in advance so that you can put it in the dossier, send it out for everybody to read in advance. Okay? What should not happen is an expert coming to the workshop with new data that's not been announced beforehand. You have to treat that very skeptically when they've been asked to provide it beforehand and they haven't done. Okay? They're trying to manipulate if you're not careful. So you've got to watch all these things. So the evidence dossier is compiled and shared with the experts. It summarizes the relevant information. Very often the information obviously is very bulky. You've got masses of data sets and so on. You're summarizing this. And if you're not careful, you're going to summarize it in ways which lead the experts in particular ways. So you have to be careful about how you summarize the evidence. And it's important also to point out weaknesses. As I said, your, your, your data never answers the question completely. There are always small sample sizes, experimental technique concerns. Parameter relates to a different thing than you're quite interested in. Different region, different gender, different duration, different et cetera, et cetera. Okay? You will list in the references all the items that may be of relevance because that gives the experts the chance to read them up before the meeting. But you don't want a dossier that is hard to leaf through actually during the meeting. You want something which is actually usable. So here's the flowchart. Everything inside the big box outside is pre-elicitation before you get to the final thing of conducting the workshop. Identify the experts. I, Allocate them to workshops. You may need several parameters. You may need several groups of experts. Get their commitment. Agree the workshop dates. Prepare your first evidence dossier, but then brief the experts. Get them to get any additional evidence they might have. Train them. Get your venue ready. Update the evidence dossier from what they've told you, and then you're ready to actually conduct the workshop. This process can take weeks, months even sometimes, because experts often are hard to get together when you look at their diaries. Sometimes you have to give in and say, okay, this guy can join us by video conference because it's just not feasible in his diary to do it any other way. But a workshop is going to last at least a day, often two days. It's a lot of work to be involved in getting people to come up with sensible conclusions at the end of the day. You have to keep testing and testing what they're doing. The shelf system I mentioned before, is a, it's not you know, a, a system you can plug into and it does the work for you, okay? Mainly, it's a package of documents giving you guidance and templates to use. There are some functions some in the language R which are available to help you fit the distributions and feedback consequences of that fitted distribution. That's kind of important. But more important in this shelf system is all the package of documents and the guidance. And I, I would encourage you to go and get it, download the latest version, and look at those documents. There's lots of references in there. Well, there's all the main references that are in there that you might want to do, so I'm not going to put references in the, in the talk here. But this is you know, my website, tonyohagen.co.uk okay, slash shelf. There are various forms. Shelf 1, which is completed at the beginning and has all the housekeeping stuff in it. 
But there's some important stuff in there, like um, expressions of, uh, of interest. Nobody comes to an elicitation workshop without having some potential conflicts of interest. Even, even pure academics, they have an interest in making this an important issue in stressing the dangers or whatever because they're the experts in it, okay? Everybody comes with some baggage. We declare it at the beginning. It doesn't stop them participating, but once they've declared it, it's a remarkable how reasonable some people can become. We complete a shelf two form for every one of, of the individual distributions that we elicit. And there's, because shelf now has uh, a couple of frameworks for doing multivariate elicitation for several variables. There's a shelf three form, which is a way of bringing these together. There's two forms of the multivariate considered, the Dirichlet and uh, Gaussian copula, which covers quite a wide range of options, okay? Finally, I just want to quickly run through different roles of people who are involved in, in this process. The experts are obviously vital. We want to select them. It's a very important task. I've annoyed another group of people by saying, no stakeholders, please. Stakeholders are not there to, to discuss. Okay, they're not there to be reasonable on the whole. I've known ex nice, really reasonable, sensible stakeholders, but on the whole, not. They're there to present their side. You get them to send you evidence. You invite them to submit evidence, which will be put into the dossier. You might even invite them to observe, but they are not there to, to assimilate the evidence, bring it together. You want people who are capable of combining all that knowledge and making sensible judgments as a result. Another reason why you don't need lots of people is if you start getting stakeholders in, there's usually at least a dozen. Okay, that's gonna mess everything up. Okay, the facilitator is crucial, again, because controlling all this, you, you'll have seen that there are difficulties, there are all sorts of things to be aware of. It's one reason why colleagues who work in this field don't do behavioral aggregation. They don't feel confident that as, as a result of doing this, you haven't produced something which is more the facilitator's opinion than anybody else's. It is a risk. At the end of the day, to some extent, I, as, as the facilitator, I'm thinking of myself as Rio. I'm that rational, impartial observer. I'm not going to impose anything on them, but if they come up with an opinion that does not seem to be a rational, impartial judgment based on what they've said, I'll challenge it. I won't stop them if that's what they really want to say, but I, I, I won't let them go forward until they've explained themselves. Recorder. Um, Facilitator has got enough to do watching, watching what's going on. So you have a, a recorder as well who's in charge of the documentation. Doesn't necessarily complete the documentation at the time, but takes very good notes. And we all know how rare it is to find a good note taker. Okay, So somebody who can do that is another skilled and important job. They also typically run the software. So that's three important roles. Less important, perhaps, the coordinator or project manager we have to recognize that person's there because there's a lot of organizing to do and they need to be recognized. Sometimes you will have observers, non-voting people, if you like, in the workshop. Ideally, they should keep their mouth shut except when being invited to speak. They may be invited to speak, as I say, on helping the facilitator understand some of the technical arguments. I try to get to the point before I go in as a facilitator where I think I understand the dossier. If I don't do that, I feel I'm really in trouble. So I have to know enough about the field to know what the, the importance of the dossier is. And that means working with the client. The client, of course, is this other person here who's very important. They own the problem. They're the person to whom you're giving the result, and they're the people for whom this Rio perspective is important. They want that. They want to have a synthesis of this knowledge, which is what it would be reasonable to think based on what the experts have all said. Okay? So in summary, elicitation has many uses. When you've got no data, weak data, etc., etc. Doing it well is not easy or cheap. You do need a well-designed protocol and stick to it. 
And then one advantage of shelf is you, you have to because you're working your way down these documents which take you through the process step by step. I prefer to use behavioral aggregation because I think it makes better use of the available information. I'd rather have the people actually starting off with a, their, whatever their opinions are and then talking about it. You, you, you get a lot out of that. They like it, by the way. Whenever I get back to uh, getting the feedback forms from them, they say, yeah, this is really useful. I didn't expect it to be. I talked with this guy that I only ever meet at conferences, and he, he, either I'm giving a talk which he's attacking, or he's giving a talk which I'm attacking. We don't actually ever really talk about these things in a civilized way. OK? I hope we're going to be civilized today. I haven't made a good start, have I? <laughs> um, so so it's, it's, it's actually a very useful process for these people very often. And quite often you've got experts who are not all from the same narrow field. They're bringing in different perspectives on the problem. No, no one of them has enough inf information, if you like, on their own to really answer the question. They need to talk with everybody else. Even after they've seen the dossier, they, they need help with understanding and understanding the importance and significance of some of those things. So the talking is important. So I do that um, because I think it works better. And it's kind of fun as well. Right, that's it. Thank you. Any questions? Oh, OK. <laughs> I'm going. <laughs> After a while, so perhaps uh, let's try to keep the questions short and the answers short, perhaps for this first time. Uh, first of all, very nice talk, Tony. Thank you very much. Um, some people um, uh, try and elicit uh, and develop systematic tools for eliciting knowledge from people who are clearly not experts in any normal sense of the term. Uh, Mark Bergman at Imperial College now, for example. Um, could do, I would be interested in your attitude uh, towards the elicitation from uh, wisdom, the crowd sort of context, in a systematic way. Uh, what is the relation, what is your attitude towards those uh, attempts? Yeah, um, I haven't really looked into that. I mean, it, it certainly doesn't fit this, this approach of take a few experts who really know and, and bring them together. Um, and I've always been rather skeptical of uh, sort of taking a large number of experts or a large number of people and somehow just bunging them all together in an average. So much depends upon um, the selection of experts. If, if there are particular pressure groups who are more inclined to answer, which I think is, it could be the problem with that sort of area, um, then you get, they get overweighted. Um, so I try not to have in, in my discussions two people from the same background with the same sort of beliefs that I know are going to think the same things. If every person in there is representing the body of opinion that agrees with them, that, that part of the community out there that agrees with them. They're not representing only themselves. Um, and so we can get a, a meaningful debate about that. And sometimes, you know, they will weigh in and say, look, this isn't just me that thinks this. Three quarters of the community thinks this, guys, OK? That's, that's useful information, OK? Um, Yes, if you put it together, I've, I've heard that it works. I have no more really to say about that. Uh, my question is about the, the Rio uh, yeah. stage. Uh, <clears throat> it's kind of two parts. So one is what's, what's happening in it, what do you think should be happening? And in particular, in terms of, I'm thinking about the distinction, one value of the deliberation is simply that you learn others point of view, others' argument, and you improve your own per, uh, opinion irrespective of any ops, outside, uh, outsider perspective. But then on top of that, you, you seem to say the uh, real perspective is important. How, okay. how can we conceptualize it? How, uh, what, pe what do people seem to do? In it's, it's, yeah. Well, we certainly don't expect them all to do the first thing and just all converge to the same belief. We know that's not going to happen. They're all going to go away thinking different things, um, which is why the, we have to bring in this, uh, this real perspective to say, um, OK, I know you don't all agree, but you also all, I want you to accept that there is some merit in what the other people believe, and that an external observer wouldn't necessarily agree exactly with you. They would give some weight to these other people. Um, 
And we never actually ask them to weight anything. Okay, we ask them to debate down on particular questions. So actually at this stage, I usually do ask, what's the probability this thing is greater than this number? Because enough numbers have already been put into the, the discourse. And um, by if, if asking people to reach a group consensus on something like a median is, is very difficult. They'll end up just sort of averaging their original thoughts. But asking people, what's the probability it's less than some point, which you deliberately choose to be not close to what would be a median, um, the focus is their discussion, and often you choose that point as a, as a value which actually highlights some of the differences between them, and they can debate onto that. So I think that what, what, what tends to happen is that in the end some compromise is reached, and people um, are by then willing to do that. Whether it's really what Rio would think at the end of the day, well, that's what I have to make that kind of judgment um, as best I can and I'm not as knowledgeable as fictional Rio would be about their field. So, uh, so this is really uh, in the same vein. I'm just wondering what rational and impartial means for you. I mean, I guess rational is Bayesian. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that seems like a reasonable answer. Yeah, uh, it's consistent anyway. With <laughs> but impartial, I mean, uh, an impartial Bayesian, is that somebody whose prior has a certain form, it's sort of evidence-free or something like that? I, I think why would you want people to? I, th I think so. I think we don't want, uh, uh, it's, not, it's not possible to imagine somebody else bringing their own different perspectives to this. Usually the client uh, is going to defer to what the experts think. Um, the, the client doesn't have strong opinions of their own. And that's, so the, in, a, in another sense, the Rio is, is the client. Um, somebody who comes to listen and to, and to try and absorb what's said without bringing the, any particular view of their own to the table. That's why they're impartial. Incidentally, it's probably worth saying because it relates back to your question, Chuck, that the, uh, the possibility that we don't get this, that, that the experts don't agree. Um, like experts in elicitation don't agree, that you find that they will not do this. Um, I had one occasion where one expert simply stormed out of the meeting and said, these other guys are wrong, I'm right, there is no compromise possible. Okay? What happened after that was all the other people in the meeting proceeded to do this, taking that person's opinion into account, and, and reached what actually seemed to me to be a sensible outcome, giving some due weight, and quite a lot of weight, in fact, to what this rather hot-headed guy thought. So, you know, it, it generally works. But it's possible that you can end up by saying, we have two opinions, and I cannot reconcile them. They cannot reconcile it. We've elicited two separate di distributions, consensus is gr this group or this group, and that's all we've got. And I don't know any way to weight these two, because my, my selection of experts wasn't designed to be representative in any way. It goes back to the client then to make that choice. And they have to now be partial in some sense. They have to read what's said and make their own judgment. So that but that hasn't actually happened. Sorry? So does that mean it's not representable by probability? This is a situation. Yeah, of course. It, of course well. It's an imprecise probability. <laughs> <laughs> No, um, <laughs> I, I think that's taking us into the area that I said I wasn't going to debate too much. <laughs> but it, it's important, uh, I accept that, but we, we could end up talking a lot about that. We don't have much time. Uh, well, it's a short one. So at the beginning of the Sheffield process, you asked for the individual distributions of each expert, and at the end you observed the aggregate one. Yes. So do you have any form of estimation of the pooling function? Of the? Of the pooling function, because you're doing a, a, a real pooling process. Yes. You say you don't like the an, an analytical way of doing it, but you could estimate it. OK, it, it will not be any linear combination of what they started from. One thing that I do, um, and the software allows you to do, is you can see the, the simple unweighted linear pool of the, this, their starting positions. Uh, it gives you another reference point when you're looking at what changes occurred. You'd, I never show that to the experts. It would lead them in the wrong directions. But, but yeah, I, I've, I've never tried to. Uh, and because they wouldn't go back and think those things now anyway, after the debate. 
their, their beliefs would be different. I've never tried eliciting their individual beliefs after the debate and yeah. seen what happened then. Um, it might be informative, but it's another task that is not actually... I'm, I'm wasting their time for my benefit on, on doing that, really. Because I, I was thinking in the theoretical pooling function literature, uh, some authors argue that you should pull descriptively, you should pull things like with a geometrical average and not in a linear average, for instance, and you could, you could provide an estimate of that. It's trying to fit it with a geometrical average might be better, representing better reality than a linear one. Okay. Um, well, no, the, the geometric, geometric pool um, overshrinks quite strongly. Um, so I, and that's why no, almost nobody I know actually uses it in practice. So thanks a lot, uh, Tony, for, Thank you. for this.